been having a lot of fun with this title. It's been changed many times because we were afraid that you all would think that we were divas if we kept this name, but we decided we were, so we're keeping it. <laughs> the first thing I want to do is just, from left to right, we have Kimberly, Akaya, Donna, and Georgette, and we're going to have a great conversation with all of you, but we want you to have a little bit of a conversation with each other before we start, and we would like for you to pair up in twos or threes, and we're gonna go for maybe three or four minutes. What made you decide to come to this panel? What be your first question? So let's start with that. Everyone. Okay. And the, the ladies in the room in particular are gonna go first if you're in a conversation with a man. The women first. Something you're really proud of that you've done. Name it, claim it, say it to each other right now. And in a lot of times when we are in professional settings, we tend to um, answer those questions perfunctorily and then it gets very quiet and we wait for what's next. And there's just this energy in this room already that I think naming it Money Davis actually was to think. Now, I'm not really a diva. I'm just here to moderate the Davis. <laughs> What I'm gonna, how I'm gonna start is, y'all are on the spot now. You're each gonna talk about one thing you're really proud of. And one of the things we said was that women sometimes don't have the opportunity to say what they're proud of. Their resumes don't list it. They don't, you know, I, my daughter who's sitting on the front row wrote my bio for the program book because I was afraid to write it because I might sound braggadocious and it's really quite lovely what she said about me. Uh, and I let it stand and it was hard to not edit it down. It's longer than anybody else's and that was a really hard thing for me to do. But I will start, I've, I've spoken at the Vatican. So Georgette, what have you done? <laughs> A speaker, but I was a, a plenary speaker. Yes, I wasn't just on a panel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Money and meeting. So I was one of the early pioneers in impact investing, directing towards um, premium financial returns. And my last event brought together 125 investors representing four and a half trillion dollars. when we were. Yeah. 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 Um, not much to say after that. No, um, um, okay, so mine, I'm proudest of, um, I worked for a think tank and I built a think tank and I worked on carbon taxes uh, for 10 years and helped bring in the first carbon tax in North America and British Columbia um, Woo. at a time where people said there would never be a carbon tax in North America. So that was, that was pretty impressive. She launched change finance yeah. and it just went live on Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. And it was democ democratizing investment in, in ways I've never heard or seen before. So kudos to my sister. <laughs> well, I'm going to get a little less uh, <clears throat> fabulous. I used to I used to think I had a um, fear of heights, so I went skydiving. <laughs> I jumped out of a plane and I realized what I was not afraid. It wasn't afraid of heights, it was afraid of edges. Which is very different. Wow. Edges. Wow. <laughs> or afraid of landing. <laughs> uh, my name is Kimberly King. And well, how I answered the, the group here that I'd like to say first is I am most proud of learning how to stand in my truth, even when it costs me. That is actually what I'm most proud of. <laughs> Professionally speaking, um, this is helping me realize there are, are many and I want to learn to own them even more. But one thing I'm proud of is that I had um, a vision and an idea before we had one-stop shopping for financial services of bringing not only companies together, but industries together from the banking and the investment community. 
and the laws would not allow us to do it yet. I engineered a way to do it, put together a national joint venture with the Credit Union Association and American Express Financial Advisors, and it did over a billion dollars a year. I'm proud of that. So I'm gonna ask you all to have another little conversation really quickly about, you come to this conference called SOCAP and you come to this session about money divas. What do you want from money or finance? What are you looking for? What do you want from money or finance? What do you want from money? What do you want from finance? Who's willing to, who's willing to give us one? Come on, yes. I'm gonna to point to people if you don't volunteer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I've been changing a woman's life with money. So I want to leave money to change other, to change the lives of young girls and women. All right. That's my purpose of money. Good. Thank you. Can you repeat it? She wants to change the lives of women and girls, and that's her purpose, and she wants money to help her do that. You're from Cameroon? I'm from Cameroon, but I'm from Cameroon. She came from Cameroon, this is her first session. <laughs> she came up to me yesterday and said, with tears in her eyes, I think, that she was so excited that there were women here, that she, was, she thought it was gonna be all <laughs> When I is from the internet, I saw soccer. My mind was only men. But the first day when we came, I saw a woman came up, another woman, another woman. <laughs> We're glad you're here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sonia uh, Renee Taylor, founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not an Apology. Um, and. The first thing that came to my mind is this idea of I've been doing so much with so little for so long, I'm capable of doing anything with nothing. Uh, and so I, I can't help but imagine what would, what would impact look like if I were doing all of the things, if we were doing all of the things that we've been doing with so little resource, with the appropriate amount of resource in relationship to the impact that we're putting out in the world. its appropriate role in the currency of our life. Yeah. That it's really just one more form of creative trade in a form of honoring your contribution and mine and the exchanges we make. That this should be an instrument of honor, not an instrument of terror or, mm, I don't want to say a chiasm. So don't. Don't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a good to build on that because I think that this tr could turn into a currency of good. And as you read it, the forward, 
we believe that there's a radical difference in how money can move. And we're here to make it move in that direction. You know, I'd like to see money connect us as opposed to isolate us from one another. Like what if we were to use it to get closer? Right? So that that distance between those of us who have it and then those of us who don't have it and need it just gets like we don't like it's not that hard. And I think we make it harder than it needs to be. So if we could just I mean, could you snuggle in a little bit? No, that's for real. Could you just get a little closer now? Yeah, just move in. And you know, actually get close enough so that you can actually like smell the person next to you. Now what if the person next to you were your honey? Like your honey, like your kin, that's your, your, your neighbor, your kin, somebody that you will love one of these days, right? Like that's how I want, that's what I want money to do. of a Wall Street fund company. I just have to say that. My, my 22 year old is still looking at me going, what the, what happened? Um, but the truth was, I had worked for Greenpeace, I had worked on carbon taxes, I had run a clean energy company that built projects with indigenous communities, and I had done little to nothing to dial the needle differently on climate change. I was completely distraught. Um, and so I, I wound up uh, being invited to the Unreasonable Institute, and um, while I was there, I started asking every capital partner that came through, all the money people, so what's your deal flow to women? And what's your deal flow to people of color? And I just got the most hideous answers. It just broke my heart. And I think um, I wound up leaving and going, okay, that's mine. Like, this pisses me off so much. I'm so offended. I'm so hurt. I'm so upset that I have to take this on. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to take it on. So that's what pulled me into the financial system. And so I have this simple thing. Genius is evenly distributed everywhere. It is maybe more concentrated in the hoods and on the reservations and in the favelas and in the bodies of women. Because if you've ever had to struggle, you're more creative. You're more disruptive. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the smarty pants white boys in Silicon Valley get all the money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now how does one fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole reason for my founding my Take Action conference was because I, you know, I, I, I worked in civil rights earlier, and of course every civil rights person gets an MBA, right? So, <laughs> so that's what I did, and I did venture capital, and then I worked for um, a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. Um, but I kept on seeing these patterns where, why does bad behavior get rewarded with high return? And what about, and what is not being counted in, in these analyses? Um, so the whole reason for my starting Take Action was A, to see if impact investing was going to be for real, particularly if we target premium financial returns. And secondly, I was trying to figure out how, if we could, how do we showcase those investments where the investment thesis and the value is so strong that if you do social and environmental good, you get outperformance. Like if you could shine a light on those, then the idea would be then maybe people would follow. So my wish is that money that does good for the world and for people and communities gets outperformance and stuff that destroys gets the worst performance. I'm trying to figure out where to go with this, but I'm going to, I'm going to go. So um, two weeks from now, I think 
if, if you've read my stunning biography, um, <laughs> you know that I'm an Episcopal priest, and in two weeks, um, five of my close female clergy friends are coming to my house to spend three days, and we were trying to decide what our agenda was going to be, and one of them wrote me, uh, one of them wrote all of us and said, what do you want to talk about? And of course, we'll each take an hour or two to talk about what's going on in our lives, and maybe we can devote the rest of the time to smashing the patriarchy. So the almost unanimous response was, let's not spend any time on our own stuff. Let's just work on smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> and so while I don't think that the point of this panel is exactly smashing the patriarchy, well, exactly, precisely. We do believe across this board that we're missing something because the patriarchy won't let women have their voices and won't let women, particularly in this world of finance, speak to it. And I would, I, which, which one of you would like to take the first crack at how this world would be different if women had an equal voice at the finance table? Kimberly. <laughs> Why Kimberly? No, it doesn't have. It doesn't have to be. Okay, Kimberly. Um, I believe there would be more trust. There would be more, not just equity in that we would be at the table, but I believe that in the feminine, which can be in a man. Fem masculine and feminine is ultimately not about gender, but right now our gender is holding the stand for it in our whole selves, in our whole bodies. But she has been underneath and she needs to come alongside now. I am not interested in a matriarchy, personally. I am interested in a sacred partnership that will right the balance of the axis of the entire world. If we get to make our stand beside, everything in the universe will come into sacred alignment. I really believe that. Amen. I wouldn't mind a matriarchy for <laughs> No, like for, for real. Maybe just a couple generations clean up the mess. You know? <laughs> no, for real. Um, Look, if the, system, if the system doesn't change, we can put all kinds of women every kind of wear and, and it'll replicate itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I like to pretend that, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll have women in the cabinets and women in the presidencies and women on, on the board of, of directors and somehow magically that it's all just going to turn into um, Nirvana, Nirvana and it's not going to happen. So, here's my dream. I'm imagining a whole host of millennial and Gen X badass women going in and just tearing it up and yeah. remaking it. Yes. <laughs> because us gray hairs, it's not, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do it. But what we can do is support the next generations to do it, right? Um, so, I'm, I'm not utopic, I'm not, but I do believe that the youngsters have the, the key. That's you, Georgia. No, that is, for real. And the best thing I could do is make sure you succeed. I'm gonna beat you up on that. <laughs> no, I just said that publicly, and I, yeah. I don't, uh, my word is as good as my bond, so. I'm pretty gray and I still have tearing up to do. Um, and, 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 um, and so I guess here's my here's my take. Um, one of the things that really gets to me right now about the so-called kind of ethical financial space, um, you know, I'm not going to name names, but there's a product in the ticker as S H E, um, and it, 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 it's you know it's this she product and it's pink wrapped filthy, dirty companies, right? It's yeah. Monsanto yeah. and oil companies yeah. and mining companies. The extraction industry is very clever. They have figured out they can get big points out of the financial industry and look really good wrapping themselves pink. And it pisses me off. 
Um, and so one of the things I hope that's gonna happen through this company we're building, and we are women-owned, women majority team, majority women board, and now we're majority women investors, is that it actually becomes a story of women walking up to Wall Street and fundamentally changing the game, which means zero fossil fuels, no Monsanto, no carcinogenic chemicals, clean air, clean water, indigenous rights, human rights, gender lens, all of it in everything we do, always. And that's how I think women have to be in this space. We have to be transformational actors. We can't be pink, wrapped, dirty, nasty things. So, on the data side, because I'm a data nerd and a geek, um, there was a study put out by Nordea, which looked at a lot of publicly traded companies, and it showed that if you had women as the number one or number two in a firm, the performance was twice that of male-run companies. 25% versus 11%. This is a 2017 study. So it's pretty powerful to see, and obviously it's great for, um, for gender lens investing, which Suzanne is pioneering and Catherine is doing a lot of work in too. Um, so that's one way I think to breathe out forms, but I think it's because there's this ability to hold so many things at once, right? It's, it's ability, I mean, people talk about multitasking, which sometimes I can do well and sometimes I really can't, um, but it's this ability to hold, right? More than one thing. You can kind of hold what's primary in front of you and look at patterns that are around you and then figure out a new way of synthesizing. So I think that ability to hold so much um, and to work on multiple levels at the same time, I think that's how finance would, would change. Um, I think one of my advisors to me in my Take Action conference was the, one of the co-founders of Emerge America, which is a network of Democrat, uh, trading democratic women for office. And she said, you know, it's not surprising to me that women are leading in impact investing, because women always lead early, right? We can see it, we can change it. I think it's the, how do we hold on to it? How do we hold on to this power because if you look at impact investing, right, and it's trending to mainstream mm -hmm. financial investing, who holds, right? Who who is the predominant person in that? Yeah. Not really women. <laughs> it's not people of color. So we have to be. So my question and my challenge for those interested in impact investing is: How do we not replicate that That's same right. system? How do we keep hold that power, hold that competitive advantage? And part of it for me is and this goes beyond your question. Um, <laughs> is how do we also incorporate the communities about which we care? Um, I know that when I was doing investing, my colleagues who were actually the portfolio managers, we didn't never, we never talked to anybody in the local communities as to what they wanted. Right? And I think that it's, and it's a hard thing to do, right? I, even as I figure out like, okay, if I wanna work in the Asian American community, for example, I, I'm, I, I'm second, third generation, so I don't speak Chinese, but I have a long history here, and I know the right organizations where I was on the board, like where to go and get that dialogue and get that trusted relationship and actually build something that that community really wants. But that's at the small level, right? Like that's at the micro stuff that'll really make a huge difference. And where I'm trying to figure out is how do you take something small and then also get it up to the billion dollars where, you know, or more, or trillion dollars where it can really really make a difference. So I think that ability to think from small to big is, is something that um, women do very well, as well as holding a lot of dimensions at the same time. This is not the other end of that, or the other part of that dance, is I live over in Social Justice Landia, where um, most folks are working really hard in the nonprofit sector to make changes in their contexts, in their communities, et cetera. And most, uh, a lot of, I won't, I'll say a, a large percentage of people who are working in nonprofits have no clue about how money works. Mm -hmm. They might know how to, you know, there's a, there's a um, you know, look at the budgets and all of that. That's not, how, that's not how money works, right? And so there's some work that needs to be done 
on the ground about having leaders see themselves as actors in the system as opposed to acted upon, mm -hmm. right? And that's there's work there, and it's more than just financial literacy, which I'm like, I could never hear that word again. I'd be all right, but <laughs> um, but it, because it isn't just about how to add up numbers and make sure your spreadsheet's in, in order. It, there's and as I'm learning this, I realize oh, this is not that hard. <coughs> Some of the minutia of a particular product might be tricky because you need to get the law right and that kind of stuff. But basically, is is what are the set of agreements by which money flows? And so many of us have stuck over in I'm anti-capitalist without understanding that our nonprofits absolutely depend on the capitalist system. And if we don't actually act in it, then we will continue to be victims of it. So there's that piece on the other side, which is the um, it, it interrupting the notion that we have no power, when in fact we have a lot of power for this table. Can I add one real quick? Do you like this? Um, so one of the things when we were talking about this panel, and one of the things that sort of intrigued me about this title of Money Divas, which I think is kind of playful, um, one of the things that occurs to me about when we get comfortable in a space and in our skin is that we actually become more playful, right? That we can hold things lightly. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, I think my personal breakthrough around that came when we were working on carbon taxes and I set up a URL, I set up a, a website and a URL and ran this campaign called Taxes Are Sexy. <laughs> and, um, and it was, you know, it was really weird. It was intended to be provocative, and it, it was an invitation. People would say, "What? What are you talking about?" Right? And we did it on campuses, and young people made all these funky T-shirts, and they made underwear that said "Taxes are sexy" and all this stuff. Um, and it was really about getting people to go. There's something really sexy about a strategy that's underutilized by progressives to kick butt. And you're inviting, when you're playful with something, you invite people to come inside of it. And so financial literacy is hideous for the most part because it's dry as toast, it's pedantic, um, and poor people tend to live inside oral cultures and there tends to be very exquisite sense of humor. And, and so I think when we're thinking about teaching entrepreneurship, teaching financial literacy, teaching economics, making these things accessible to people, it's really important sometimes to play and make it ridiculous and funny and, and quirky because it creates a different way for people to come inside it. So recently I, I've been like, trying to get up to speed on economics, so I went and bought a bunch of books on it. And here's what I found out, it's made up. <laughs> I was like, really? It's not like science. It's not like something from the universe that is eternal and um, sacred. It's somebody said, you know what? Let's do some. Let's pretend like it's a mechanical system, and we'll, we'll call it flow. I'm like, oh, well. So if we, it was made up from the gate, we can remake it. Right? I'll build on that. First of all, we were talking about one of the statements earlier about the, the system, the Dalai Lama has a great quote um, that sort of puts in perspective, it is important to understand how things work. Um, and we're talking about how to maybe make that accessible in a way that actually we can stay awake long enough to grok what we need to. But the Dalai Lama says, first, you must understand the rules. So you must, so you can then break them properly. <laughs> and so um, I'm okay that for me to suit up, I want to understand the rules. But you can bet I'm there to break them properly and otherwise. And I had that same kind of really um, staggering aha around economics, like my first economics course, and that these were. We almost treat them like the tablets brought down, That's right. and they're and they're for we must. And I'm like, no, someone made up those agreements, which became the universal agreement, and now we're doing it. It is time for a new universal agreement, and I'll come back to the leadership of women. We got to bring on our inner diva, 
and our elder diva and understand that we are the ones who can break the rules properly, who must redefine the rules now. They must be fair to all of us because there is no other way. And that's why this is the right title for this course because it's not only how we're bringing it on in ours, but it truly is the challenge and the invitation to do, to do this ourselves. The leadership is not coming from anywhere else. Let's break it properly and otherwise. This, this is a similar question to the first one, but I'm gonna give it a shot because I think we may go somewhere with it. What, what rules do you want to break, Donna? Mm. Mm. Is my team listening? Mm -hmm. My lawyer's listening? <laughs> Nobody's listening. Nobody's recording this, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think mostly I want to break the rules I set for myself. I think I have a habit of stepping on my own head. And so I really want to, um, I want to get more permissive with myself. I want to be more gentle with myself um, when I mess up, because I do hard things and I take risks. Um, but I, I really want to get out of my own way. I want to, I want to break the rules that break my own heart and that prevent me from being as big as I can be, because this is a time to play really big, right? This is, whether you believe we were chosen for this time, whatever you believe about this moment in time, extreme poverty, climate change, the grave injustices of this moment call us to be enormous. So I want to break the rules that keep me from being really, really big. Georgia, what rules do you want to break? So many. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the fiduciary win. That was good. That was a good one. I want to break, so I want to break the rules that say you can't put your values in your investing, right? Because mm -hmm. that's been something that's been very um, I want to break the rules that say shareholder value is the most important thing. Um, I just wrote this chapter for a book that's coming out in the spring. It's, about, it's for, um, it's called Visionary Evaluation for a Just and Sustainable World. And uh, I was invited to it by a dear friend, lovely Dylan, who um, came out of the Gates Foundation and we're trying to figure out how do you, how do evaluators, which has been evaluating the good work of agencies, government agencies and nonprofits, how do they bring their secret special thing that they do to this field when what they measure is a decade and what financial people measure is hours, <laughs> days, maybe if you get to the 10 year mark with some of the private equity venture capital thing. And we were trying to figure out how do you break that rule that says you can't measure it? Like how do you how do you do that? And I know there's lots of iterations, lots of people are trying it, but how do we say, like, look, this really matters? And how do we make it so that there's this thing, I don't know. This so I'm sorry, I'm thinking aloud a little bit on this, but I'm so maybe that's another rule. It's like it doesn't have to be fully formed before it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> How do we make sure we're measuring the right thing before we do stuff? Or can we have a thesis about it before and say like, yeah, this is okay, it's financial, people can do it. So one of the things that I thought was interesting, I was talking to a friend at, a, at one of the largest pension plans in, in the country, and we, he said, you know, Georgia, I need to plan. So tell me what's going on with impact investing, because it's gonna take me three years to turn the ship around. Right, if we, you know, and partly it's just systems internally. And at um, COP21, right, two years ago, they came out with a billion dollar product, right? And it was just from a set of conversations that he and I had around what was going on and can I connect him to these different people. But I, I'm wondering, why does it take so long? Is it just the systems or is it because there's a value piece and there needs to be this justification? Because I know that 
Investment managers take leaps of, on intuition all the time. So what is it about this particular impact investing that stops people from, I mean, some of them do it, right? Like Maya can do it and she can get the returns. Um, but what is it particularly that stops and why is it different? I want to go back to all of you. Oh, we only have a few more minutes, but I'm wondering what inspiration for breaking the rules you might have gotten here today. Take a minute and talk to each other. <laughs> what rule might you want to break? <laughs> A man that I'm very close to named Kevin <laughs> said at a session we were having with a bunch of clergy when they were asking about money and he was saying what well, we tried to do at SoCap and they said, well, that's way too hopeful. And he said the times are too deep and dark for anything but hope. And I think that's what you're saying is we can't, we can't play this safe. We got to do it. Yeah, sure. And I want to uh, throw in here that one of the things we talked about as we were anticipating this panel was how, how prepared should we get. We decided to not prepare. <laughs> and it was important because we, women often think, oh, I'm not prepared. Mm. And we've been prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> Women stop ourselves because we think we have to get prepared and we've been prepared. Yeah. So if we stop trying to prepare to get ready to do something and just freaking do it <laughs> and, and, and trust that we, are, we have done enough preparation, otherwise we wouldn't be faced with the thing to do. So just jump. And don't jump by yourself, find your sisters. We, got, we need each other.
My dad told me a million times, Rosalie, you don't know the you don't know the value of a dollar, you don't know the meaning of the dollar, but teach me. You know, let's yeah. teach, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we're at SoCal, which is the intersection of money and needs. There's many of us from what did you call it, the nonprofit Zambia or social Zambia. <laughs> There's then the investment capital thinking. There needs to be more intersection, which one of you said you need to learn how to be actors in these systems. It seems to me you all are sharing of wisdom and teaching that would influence the, the infrastructures that exist and create that intersection. And I just wonder, maybe you put out the challenge that how could you create a learning space for women to be more actors in the systems and know how to create new systems? That's a great idea. What do y'all think? <laughs> I think you should take some leadership around that. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right, then maybe we all need to take some leadership, but it's good. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And let's make that happen. Yes, and, and I run this conference, and we're now four minutes over, but let's keep going. We're going to break, because you have to be on time. Yeah, this is the last, this, but this will be the last comment. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to address your comment, um, and I'm more from the investment management space, and this is my first SOCAP, but there, we've been doing a couple of things. My name is Pam Wood, they are Farmers Investment, and we've just launched a product with Investopedia. We're creating an impact hub, a community essentially for exactly what you just asked for, where um, nonprofits and investment managers and entrepreneurs and academics and um, professional entities can all come together and meet in one space. And we're going to launch it in January. So I would love to have all of you participate. Kimberly and I have already discussed some things. And um, I want to address two of the things comment that you made about women in, in finance, um, we have an organization called um, Institute on Campus, and we are in about 20 campuses today across the country and trying to grow by about 20 to 50 each year to do exactly that, find young people and particularly women. We have a whole program for mentoring women out of the university structure and pulling them all the way up through and finding jobs for them, internships, all of that. So I'd love to share that with, with anyone. And then I wanted to thank you because one of the things that really worries me, I was sharing with my neighbors here, is that one of the things I want to help is abuse and um, for abuse of women all around the world. And that's something that I worry about and think about every day of my life. And you just gave me a tidbit that maybe it won't be solved in my life, but we all have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for being vulnerable and not good care. So, I would actually like to do a plug because I'd like your help. Um, we're launching a fintech called OnePebble.com. I am proposing to them that we have a women's leadership level and that we do it in a different way of how we develop it. I'm going to take the challenge of this room and invite you, you write Kimberly at OnePebble.com if you'd like to play into that, because I'd like to prove that what we started today is a force in the world, and give me a place to apply it tomorrow. Okay. Thank you.